Hello. All right. Let's uh, start with a, a concept that's been part of my work since I began painting, and that is from realism to abstraction. The idea that I was a realist painter and didn't understand abstraction, didn't have any interest in abstraction, uh, took many, many years and a lot of experience for this particular situation to actually occur. So the lecture has some to do with this concept. It has to do with moving into publishing. It has to do with the concept of the photography that's in the lobby. So there'll be many facets that I talk about. But the primary work that I'm mostly known for is an urban theme. So the urban theory series started in 1985 in San Francisco at the very end of my master's work. Uh, and I had studied with a professor. I will discuss more in detail how that came about. But I want to start back when I was a child. I mentioned this in the, the morning conversation that I would ask my father when my family took uh, vacations in the Midwest to stop so I could photograph old farm buildings. And this was actually a building that was that existed in Grand Island, Nebraska. And so I stopped and took a photo, and then later I would make paintings of these. And I started showing and selling my paintings when I was really young. So my first painting was sold when I was 13. Yeah. And, and I mowed lawns when I was a kid, but I also made money selling my paintings. So I went off to college to study with a, an artist named Robert, uh, I mean, pardon me, uh, Robert Therian. Come on in. And Robert Therian was a professor. He made paintings. And I wanted to paint in the same style that he did. But again, I had never been exposed to abstraction, didn't know what contemporary art was. And I now was in college and was approached with the idea that I should select the subject matter and make paintings of that subject over and over. So photorealism had already occurred as a movement in the 1970s. But I really related to photorealism because it was based on realism. And as a painter of the landscapes from Nebraska, it was an obvious connection to continue to paint in a realistic style. So photorealism appe appealed to me, and I selected, I don't even remember how or why, but in the 1970s, there were lots of advertisements of alcohol. So I chose, because I did the research and noticed that a lot of, of different subjects have been chosen, this idea of ice cubes and uh, liquor and water and bubbles and so on hadn't really been explored that much. So I started, when I was in college, showing these paintings to either uh, fairly small regional museums, art centers in the Midwest, uh, throughout the country. And I was exhibiting in a lot of juried exhibitions. So these paintings started off from photography out of magazines. Then I started taking my own photographs, and they became the image became a little bit more abstract. This was actually a Budweiser uh, can. In the upper left corner, you can see the Anheuser-Busch is distorted. And there's another can in the lower right corner. So these were ice cubes that I set up and with a macro lens I photographed myself. When that series ended, I was exposed to an artist named Joseph Raphael. He was from California and I really liked the way he painted. He was known for painting koi fish and lily ponds. And I was immediately interested in the idea of nature and painting uh, subjects that he 
had at least touched on, but I tried to always select new images. In this case, I, was, I gravitated back to a subject that he had already painted and other artists had painted. And obviously, one of the problems with painting a subject that somebody else is already known for is that you will hear that artist's name. So I heard, oh, this is a great painting. It looks like Joseph Raphael. And I, at a certain point, had heard that enough. So you will, you will see in the transition, this shows, this is one of the last paintings in this nature series. I was now living in Hawaii, so I had finished my undergraduate work where I'd gone from Nebraska and lived in a year in Arizona. And now I was living in Hawaii and I made this painting of coleus plants. And at this point I was exclusively taking all my own photographs. So the idea of photography was about taking pictures to make paintings. There was no, I had no interest in photography as a final product. The finished painting took six weeks working nearly every day, approximately eight to ten hours a day. So it was a very intensive painting where every small area of the painting took pretty much a day. And that would be working, this is quite a lot larger than actual size, but it was 40 by 60 inch watercolor painting. So this, obviously, I was doing very well with these paintings, and one of the first shows that I had of this work was here in Houston. And these paintings I would make, and they would sell. And I was now in graduate school in San Francisco, and I really distinctly remember this particular painting, showing this painting for a critique. And I mentioned this morning that the contemporary art world at this point wasn't about photorealism. I was studying with two internationally known photorealists. Robert Bechtel was the artist that had the most Im Im uh, impact on me. But at this point, the graduate students, my colleagues, were not making realistic paintings. So I, with this work, was really harassed. Uh, I remember the critique. I can't go into details about it because I don't remember the details, but I remember it was really intense. And it wasn't necessarily supported. They weren't criticizing how I was making a painting. They were criticizing why I was making the painting. So it became another part of the equation of how I shifted into the urban series. This particular image was very large. Again, it was done when I was in graduate school. It was from an image of when I lived in Hawaii. This particular place was on the road to Hana in, uh, on the island of Maui. So I had lived in Hawaii, and I took this image as well. This was the very last painting in the series. Uh, it was done in, at San Francisco State when I was studying for my master's degree. And this was 60 inches by 80 inches, and it was a watercolor. I still own that painting. And then these are some of the changes that occurred this is also in Chinese because I gave this particular uh, lecture many years ago and then I added some images to it. But the idea of education, especially exposure to new ideas, the fact that I was living in the environment, I was exposed to calm, the idea of painting calm and ordinary elements. So these particular issues along with a lot of others, started really shifting the way I was thinking and seeing the environment. So I started by noticing outside my front door of my apartment, it was actually a, an, an old house, and it was a two-story house, and this was out in front of it, and it was a palm plant, which I was immediately interested in viewing and photographing, but I didn't really notice or think much about the urban aspect 
until a couple weeks later when I saw also near my house this street curb that had the markings SFPD. And this truly was the beginning of the Urban Series. So this was in about 1986, and I'm still working with the urban, uh, urban subjects, and it's gone in many different directions, including the work downstairs in the lobby. This is how the series really began in terms of, uh, I would say, I took the idea of the street curb and I ultimately made a lot of paintings about streets and sidewalks and pavement and concrete. This particular one was photographed in Minneapolis, but I would say 80% of them were made in the studio, uh, meaning they weren't necessarily from a specific location. This one is also from a specific location. It's downtown Los Angeles. It was, I called this painting Broadway Bus. This is a good example of an image where it was photographed and then the painting was made. This particular painting is in the Sheldon Museum of Art in Lincoln, Nebraska. You see how the painting on the right, and it was a six by, uh, it's six by 10 feet. The image on the left clearly, to me, was an interesting photograph, but when I start making the paintings, I don't use most of the material, the information, the texture has changed, the colors are radically shifted. Uh, so the photograph served as a starting point, as a sketch, and then ultimately uh, the painting took over and I would go in any direction that I wanted. This is an example of a painting that was done in the studio from a sketch. The process of these paintings was primarily based on working dark to light. So it's a bit against tradition, I would say. I would first make the paintings black, purple, blue, brown, and then let that dry and then float a series of lighter values on top, earth colors let that dry and then add additional lighter colors on top and then ultimately add the, the markings and details and cracks and so on. Here's another example. This was, ironically, there's t now two aspects of Houston because this image on the left was photographed in Houston. And I, I had completely forgotten that until I looked at it right now. This particular image was really important for the transition going from the street looking down up to the, to the urban surfaces or walls. And I would say, ultimately, I've been looking at urban walls ever since. So this particular billboard that I discovered in Houston, it would have been in probably about 1987 or 88. And you can see how much it changes with the image on the right. The urban series took different directions in that I painted old tiles and crushed cars and all kinds of different, here's another billboard image. So I didn't want to lock into being known as a curb painter. Like, oh, Kirk Peterson, oh, he's the curb painter. I, I, when I was painting palms in nature, I had a very irritated, um, she was absolutely quite upset with me and she wrote me and said, I won't say her name, but <laughs> she said, I'm the palm woman. I paint palms. It's in my email, it's in my phone number, and please, sir, no palm fronds. <laughs> what was my next painting? It was, oh, it was no. a palm. It was a palm. <laughs> I showed in Palm Springs. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I, 
I had learned from Robert Bechtel, do not become known for painting a specific subject. Paint an attitude, paint a concept, paint ideas, paint a theme. So the urban series became that theme, and I've been able to go in multiple directions, all kinds of directions, including, again, the photography project. So it was very liberating to hear that, and I've taught my students ever since that, try not to lock into a specific subject. In the mid-90s, I went through a, a personal challenge, um, and, I, and it was a time in my life where I really couldn't use light colors, and I was painting these very dark images. So for almost two years, I made paintings that I can't say they were for therapeutic reasons, but they ended up being a way to walk through this tragic time in my life. And so I look back on that and think, well, this was required. This is all I could do. I couldn't use bright colors. And ultimately, this work was difficult to sell, but I had to make it. And I, I knew from doing these paintings that I cared less and less about the marketplace and marketing my work and selling my work, that that became less important. And I would say this work was really instrumental in breaking me away from the idea of making art to sell it. Now, of course, I still don't mind when I sell something, but I'm not motivated by that. It's not what the initial uh, point of view is. Uh, the idea of selling work is less and less important. So all of these paintings, a lot of them I still own. Most of what you just saw there I own. This was purchased by a collector in San Francisco. He put it in his living room. It's called Fairfax Burned. It was done right after the riots in Los Angeles. And to me, it was the perfect, it was somewhat symbolic of what I was feeling, you know, just the, the, the experience that I had gone through. Then I was commissioned to go to Ak Akron, Ohio, to do a large mural project on the side of, of four sides of a building. This, the back, this is the back side, so it was 110 feet long. This was the front side of the building. And then the two ends of the building were also painted. It was a really intense project. It was really fun to do. That size, the scale of it, um, caused me to look at billboards. I started noticing in Los Angeles all the billboards, and I became more interested in the idea of, of commercial art and signage. And I entered graduate school. Uh, this would be my second uh, graduate program. Now I'm getting an MFA at Claremont Graduate University. So I took those dark paintings into CGU and, and was uh, talking about what I'd experienced and where I was, and my professors would say, but that's not who you are now, and look at you, you're smiling and you're a happy guy. Why are you doing those paintings? And that was the breakthrough to move into a new group of work that was inspired both by the urban environment signage, but also by fashion advertising. So you can see the way in which Dior took certain information from, I would say, from fine artists, and specifically Mimo Rotella, and then I borrowed that back and made a painting from it. So I took their language that was borrowed from fashion, of the fashion language borrowed from fine art, and I turned it back into fine art. And here's a, a painting that was 10 feet tall and 20 feet wide called Serengeti. It was based on an advertisement of Serengeti sunglasses. Again, you can't really reference most of the information. I used the language of red, yellow, black, and white. Uh, being the most uh, eye-catching colors used by 
think about it, McDonald's, Burger King, Carl's Jr., Wells Fargo, they all use this color theme. So I took that color theme and decided that I would uh, incorporate it into abstract art, use the same language of color that was eye-catching, but use it in an abstract way. This was also based on a both of these images were based on fashion advertisements. This particular image, you can see the scale of it. The movement back into the urban environment occurred and more awareness of graffiti and urban marks, which is very much where I am again at this point with my paintings. This is actually, a, although it's not a recent painting, a pretty good example of what I'm doing right now. I asked a student of mine that's uh, Japanese if she could tell me what this painting meant, and she said no. And I said that's good. <laughs> because I, it's, it's in Japanese, but I don't want it to add a, to say anything specific. So it was, for me, the perfect way to use language and then have it not. We, we know it's supposed to say something. So these are some of the issues that I'm thinking about right now. Backing up in 2004, I went to... I mentioned this morning I went to Thailand more as a tourist, less as an artist. I went to see these limestone islands and I went to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which is a place that I'd always wanted to go to. And again, I went there to photograph, but knowing that I would not make paintings from them. So whether I was a tourist or whatever, the point is I, I saw places that were amazing to me. A year later, I went back to Bangkok because I liked the city so much. We, we talked about it more this morning. And immediately, I was photographing the subject matter that I make paintings from. So I was in Bangkok finding old billboards and numbers, and these kinds of images uh, spoke to me. They return. I did remember back in Houston. So I, I go back almost 20 years to when this fascination with this type of imagery occurred, and now it's resurfaced. And I'm finding it in Bangkok and Hong Kong. And this was one of the early images of the Urban Asia series that's being exhibited downstairs. This particular image is not in the show, but it's one of the first images that was a departure from the urban walls. It has the language, it has stripes in it, it has all kinds of formal information that I'm attracted to, but it's not an urban surface. It's an old truck. So I was at this point starting to liberate myself from only looking at walls with numbers and letters and words. And again, that departure continued when I went to Taipei. The same trip, this would have been in 2005, January 2005. So the idea of photographing a range of subjects matter, a range of subject matter took over uh, this is when KL, this was in KL, and I talked about this this morning. When I had first photographed this particular fabric store without the women walking through it, this was ultimately the image that spoke to me the most. The fabric store and the fabric was a fascinating image, but this was clearly a departure for me. The idea that the people, the interaction between the people and the environment, the fact that they're not even noticing what they're walking by because they walk by it maybe every day, 
but all these things I took note of and I started being aware of. The idea also that I had always waited for people to exit the image was something that I was very aware of. So on this trip, it, it didn't, it wasn't published in my, either of my books, this trip to New York, I was very aware and was photographing people in the environment. And then ultimately that continued when I went back to China or went to um, Singapore or went to Tokyo or Seoul. I was aware of the circumstances and I started thinking of this as the theater, uh, the theater within the urban environment. Especially the, the idea that I didn't even notice until later the guy within the tires. Mm -hmm. There were all of these circumstances and, and little nuances that in that moment of photographing it, I couldn't possibly be aware. In this particular image, look at the straps that are like, they're holding the mannequin up. <laughs> I didn't notice that when I photographed it, and I think that guy's really mad at me for photographing his shop, but, sir, this shop's very interesting. And it was one of those very difficult circumstances to try and remain neutral and photograph overall whatever I felt I wanted to take a, a shot of. Very rarely did I have people hide themselves or anything, but uh, if, if I did see that, I, I would honor in that situation and, and move on. This was shot in, um, in Yokohama. Yokohama, Japan is the, has the largest Chinatown. So the one thing that I haven't mentioned is that with most of these photographs and everything I've shown today, there's at least hundreds and sometimes dozens of other images, but sometimes even thousands of other images. So I'm only showing you the overall uh, chronology of the work. This was shot in Osaka. It ultimately was framed or recropped so that the left part of the image was eliminated. This shows the entire image. It's from the sex district, and when it only isolates the right part, you just see these beautiful reflections, and you don't even notice the content. You're not aware of where it was. You don't see that. Maybe later you'll notice, oh, look at that. I wonder what area this was in. Uh, same thing with this, the idea of bus stops and the way people were either interacting or completely isolated from each other became something else that I was photographing. This particular image I have shown a few times. I actually showed it in uh, five exhibitions in China. This image I spoke about this morning, the idea of the, the young man looking at the vending machine with love on his, the back of his shirt, and the, the young woman walking by, but misses seeing him. They both miss each other because he's plugged into his phone. The one thing that I mentioned as well, and I'm very interested in is I don't bring an agenda to this, and I don't have an opinion about technology or what cell phones have done for us or uh, what they've done to disconnect us. Uh, it's not a research I'm doing. But I do find this type of image very arresting and interesting in lots of ways. This is another image where I had photographed the billboard already, and I think 
there's a lot of information just within the billboard in the fact that it's folding over and a lot could be read into that. But when the girl, the young woman runs through, I was reframing the image and this person ran through the photo and I took the shot not knowing that she would ultimately almost be wearing the same clothes as the woman in the poster. As well in Tokyo and, uh, and all over Japan, this actually was in Kyoto. Um, I'm interested in looking at the idea of how other artists think and, and the kinds of images that might represent them. In this case, I just thought of Cristo immediately, a wrapped building. It's a construction zone. This also reminded me of the same artist wrapping up. Um, these happen to be street vendors, but just the idea of wrapped packages. So to me, beautifully wrapped up. Was in Seoul. This to me looks like a Sean Scully painting, one of my favorite artists. This particular image was photographed in Beijing. Tokyo, at the famous fish market. This particular wall in Japan, in Tokyo, I'd photographed this time, in this moment, three or four different images, and then I believe it was a year later, I found the wall again, and it had completely been painted black. This is downstairs, this image. So you really would be able to study the image downstairs is so much more detail and you really can't capture it through the digital format. This is also downstairs. This idea of, of graffiti, obviously it's really ugly and I certainly don't want it on my own house. But it's one of those things that I, in the urban environment I still see. And then this goes back to how I take some of that material and go back into the studio. Um, this was a painting that I did in, in China after a lot of photo, uh, uh, photography and uh, tours to, to various cities in Asia. Also another painting I did. So I think that's pretty much it as far as the images that I brought to talk about. So what questions do you have? Bridget. Um, for most of your painting practice, is it primarily watercolor or are you using other mediums? No, almost everything I showed after the nature paintings was acrylic on canvas. So the natural images were in watercolor and after that it pretty much went exclusively to acrylic on canvas or on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with some watercolors in there but mostly acrylic. Has the Urban Series generally been in this larger scale format? Yes. Yes. And this is, this is an exhibition of a show I had in Guangzhou, China. It shows really only about 10 or 15 percent of the show. Yeah, it was a very large space. For what kind of reception do your shows get in China? The younger people are really interested in the process. They want to know how they're made, and the slightly older generation wants to know why they're made. 
And Bridget and I talked after lunch today about the difficulty with discussing the why, because there's so much art history connected to the work. So in other words, to talk about it, one, I have to give some background, like I did today. Two, there needs to be some awareness of the artists that I'm most influenced by, which is maybe Sean Scully or Richard um, Diebenkorn, formerly uh, abstract expressionism, photorealism, the idea of fine art photography, on and on. So I would say the, the interest is based on the, the fact that the work, they've never seen this kind of work there. They may have seen it in magazines or something. No, I think it's a pretty common question, actually. And, and I think it's a fair question. It just ultimately isn't, a, there's no simple answer to it. I think that's, that's overall the hard part about art, is that a lot of people want a simple answer. What does this mean? Well, I can tell you, but let's sit down. Because there's a lot more than just the one-liner. It's not a one-liner. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Join me and you and Kirk a round of applause.